Thanks very much, Phil. Good morning. Good morning. Very good. We're alive and kicking. I like it. Very good. Um, now, for those first years, I, again, copying um, Paul Williamson, I, I um, am picking up a very slow-moving sermon series, working through uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy. Uh, last year, we looked at a, a bunch of sections, the year before that, a little bit more, and we're really only up to chapter two now. So we're looking at chapter two. We're doing the first 13 verses uh, today, and I shall pray for us, and then we'll read and uh, expound this part of Scripture. Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, that so many have come before us, that noble army, the prophets, the apostles, and uh, all uh, lived and died and breathed and worked and endeavoured uh, to be able to bring you great praise and glory and hand down uh, this beautiful gospel to us even today here in the Antipodes. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for that, and we ask that you would bless our reading of your word now, uh, that we would be encouraged in our walk with the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in the name of uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, from verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone comp uh, competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we disown him, he'll also disown us. If we're faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Those who know me know that I'm a big fan of five-year plans. I think we should do them every year, five-year plans. Does anyone do five-year plans? A few of us? Yeah, every year, how often? Tw every two, twice a year. Every two years. There you go. Are you about the same? Out every five years? What about the back? Every five years, oh, very impressive, very, very, I, I don't do them nearly as much. I, I, I think we should do them, uh, not so much to see how we've predicted a future like Nostradamus, um, but really rather so that we can have a decent laugh at ourselves for not knowing the future. The fact that actually just reminding ourselves that it's God who holds the whole world in his hands and indeed our futures in that. But if we extended our, our ministry plan out for a moment from five years maybe to 20 or perhaps 30 years, I wonder how you see uh, your ministry playing out in the future. Have you thought about that? You come to college with certain expectations, you sit in class, you think, you dream, you talk over lunch. How do you see those expectations playing out? I wonder if some of us expect to smoothly sail through successive assistant ministry positions. I wonder if some of us expect a fairly painless path of preaching the gospel, or some of simply expect a happy and healthy home life. And I ask these questions uh, because two days ago, one of our clergy brothers here in Sydney, Greg Peasley, from Pitt Town, went to be with the Lord after enduring brain cancer. I ask because another minister in our diocese, after um, you know, starting off in, in this COVID time, suffered a, st a stroke. And, as I've heard from one of the bishops, uh, there are a number of other clergy who've taken, understandably, stress leave 
at this time. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg sort of stuff. Many ministers are doing it tough right now. And I ask these sort of questions because the road ahead for all of us, even on the other side of COVID, will be a hard road. Maybe not always, but certainly at times. And it will be a hard road which requires endurance. It requires endurance. Now, of course, uh, the need for our endurance is nothing new. The poet's of old spoke into it. Owen wrote, endure and persist, this pain will turn to your good, by and by. Virgil likewise wrote, endure and keep yourselves for days of happiness. In fact, the philosopher Aristotle considered endurance an act grounded in the virtue of fortitude. But in the passage before us, we've got a different outlook actually. The Apostle Paul considers the best form of endurance an act ultimately grounded in the theological virtue of faith. And there are six mentions of endurance in Paul's second epistle to Timothy, more than any other of uh, Paul's letters. The reason, of course, is that these are his parting words to his ministry apprentice, Timothy. And he knows that the road ahead for Timothy is a hard road and a road inquiring, requiring endurance. Now, having just spoken previously about his own suffering and disappointment and endurance in the last section of the previous chapter, not that there were chapters in the original, he speaks to Timothy in familiar ter familial terms. You then, my son, again, just like the way he addresses the letter, my son, that care, that sort of familial language and affection. And in the next 13 verses tells him and us about the endurance required, the endurance which is supplied, and the endurance that is applied, required, supplied, and applied. Now, if we consider these first seven verses about the endurance required for the Christian life, in particular ministry, it's not hard to imagine Paul penning these words from prison. Speaking to his son, Timothy, gives him three strong imperatives. Be strong, verse 1, in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, the things you've heard me say, entrust to reliable men. And verse 3, the biggie, endure hardship. Be strong and trust and endure. And it's this last one that he elaborates on with those familiar illustrations, the soldier, the athlete, the farmer. All a little bit different, but each with a similar focus, a future focus. You know, the soldier illustrates the need to stay focused on the ministry. Just like when we went to the ordination service of Andrew Liz and a bunch of others in the cathedral recently, there's that one of the part of the ordination promises to forsake all worldly cares and studies or pursuits in order to keep going, pleasing our commanding officer. The athlete illustration, it illustrates the need to stay hard-working. Sorry, that's the farmer. The athlete to stay focused on God's rules in order to receive the victor's crown and the farmer to stay hard-working to get a cut of the crops. Okay, so each a little bit different, each though with a future focus. And while these illustrations, each of them has a sort of now and then dynamic to it, the main emphasis is on the now, what you need now. The endurance now, our endurance requires that soldier's discipline. I know we've got some people from army backgrounds here. There's a discipline required to be a Christian soldier, onward Christian soldiers. For an athlete, there's a sense of diligence and a farmer dedication, discipline, diligence, dedication. And, and you know, you might be enduring the hard yakka in your life or Christian ministry, even here today and hearing these words, I don't know what sort of response, gut reaction you have to hearing those metaphors and illustrations is that something that's liberating, encouraging, challenging, a bit hard to hear at this time. I'm not sure. 
but you might not have any hard yakka now, that might be tomorrow. That might be later this year, that might be next year, that will definitely be sometime during the course of your life and ministry. And when the time comes, those tough times, it will be, can be, maybe easy to slip. Just for the foot to slip. And I wonder whether which of these aspects of endurance will be um, the one in your life that will be easy to slip? Maybe the one that Satan would love to come along and try to cut away a bit. Would he use worldly concerns? Perhaps your reputation, the way other clergy perceive you, to distract your ministerial discipline? Would he use fleshly concerns? Perhaps your desires? to divert your moral diligence, the way you stay in the rules, like an athlete? Or would the devil just like to come along and deflate your dedication to the Lord, perhaps with laziness, and not be a very hard-working farmer? Of course, Paul keeps these illustrations and his application here deliberately general, rather broad, but we know that our endurance in gospel ministry will undoubtedly be tested and hardened during the course of our life by the world, the flesh and the devil. And so Paul says in verse 7, reflect on what I'm saying. Kind of idiomatic. Listen up, guys, is what he's saying. Listen up. In other words, if you want to endure in your ministry, listen up to this. For the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Now, what sort of, what's he, what's he speaking about there? What sort of insight? How's the Lord going to give us insight? How's he going to help you understand this now? Well, throughout the rest of you know, Paul's corpus of letters, um, he often uses uh, this insight, and he speaks about this insight and, he's, and this understanding, and he, and he speaks about it primarily in terms of the mystery of God, namely in Christ. And so, quite naturally, he moves from this endurance required to the endurance supplied. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. Remember, when you're doing it hard, how he died, that he was dead. Remember how he was raised from the dead. Remember that this was a flesh and blood fulfilment of planned royal prophecy. This is no little thing. He set his face like flint to the cross. I must do this. Remember these things about the Lord Jesus Christ and a heck of a lot more too. Now in this context, sure, God's people, you may be right into Timothy, sure, God's people haven't risen from the dead yet. Sure, God's people, they're doing it tough in the interim between the first and second advent. But you know, Jesus did it tough. He was crucified, in fact, for our sins. And Jesus did it tough, and yet he was raised from the dead for our resurrection life. And that is the good news. That is why Paul speaks of this in gospel terms. It's what gets us through suffering. It's what gets me up in the morning, Paul might be thinking, even though I'm chained like a common criminal. And I tell you what, God's word about God's good news, about God's son, that word cannot be chained. You know, it's a sentiment that you can imagine a Cranmer or a Ridley or a Latimer would have known in prison 500 years ago before their martyrdom. It's a sentiment that Chinese Christians would know even at this very moment in world history and other places and people too. But despite his imprisonment, Paul is so keen to preach the powerful gospel because he so keenly knows the power of the gospel. For him, as for Timothy, as for us, the endurance required depends ultimately on the endurance supplied. And it doesn't stop there for Paul. It's endurance applied for others. Verse 10, Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I love these moments in Paul's letters, by the way, where he adds these, it's like he's writing and he just, he's thinking about it and he adds with eternal glory 
as he's just imagining and picturing, picturing what's coming up. He starts talking about the gospel and he gets excited, I think. But I did skip over a word just now. I skipped over a very little word, the word too, or also, that your translations might have had. Paul says that, that they too may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. And it's as if he sees endurance and suffering as a team goal, that they too might have these things alongside me and you. Which I think explains some of the communal categories in the trustworthy saying of the last few verses. In fact, this trustworthy saying might have been an early church hymn or baptismal liturgy which plays on this endurance, salvation, team, goal dynamic. If we live, so if we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we disown him, he'll disown us. If we're faithless, he'll remain faithful for he cannot disown himself. And there's a bit of a, a kick in the end there, a bit of a challenge, I think, a prod for us in our Christian walk. But then just look at the hope as well, hey? Look at that hope. Just, just, just for a moment, I know these words wash over us quickly, but just, just look at these words. We will also live with him. Just, just think about those words, what it means to live with Christ. Think about what, what that will be like. Imagine the Apostle Paul dwelling on these things as he's writing it. Think about what will, will be like for you and you and you look around to live with him. And, and then think of the, the next one too. What will it be like to reign with him? That kingly category, if you knew my doctrine lecture the other day. What will it be like to reign with him? I suspect we can't really get our minds around these things but they're, they're profound. And, and that's the sort of thing that gets Paul and should get us really, should warm our hearts at a minimum, get us excited probably more. I reckon if we want to get a sense of how this team endurance thing works, you could try substituting, um, instead of we, put in there, say for instance, our more college community. If our more college community died with him, our more college community will also live with him. If our more college community endures, our more college community will also reign with him. You can substitute various things in there to get a real feel for what is going on. And of course, there's a massive amount of application for us from this alone, I mean, consider the person sitting next to you. Like, just do it. Think about the person who's sitting next to you right now and think about what it will be like to live together forever with the Lord Jesus. Think about what it would be like to reign together, to partake in that wonderful eternal glory. There's, of course, application for us in terms of your college cohort, after college, thinking about fourth year, college leavers, what this means, this endurance, this team sport and hope. We could go on. We need to help each other endure to the end. I don't know if you've heard of C.S. Lewis's Letters to an American Lady. It was a, a long series of correspondence that he had once with a lady, we only know her first name, we don't know much about her, we've only got the letters he wrote to her, not the ones she wrote to him. We know that she suffered um, hardship, she was recently widowed, and originally they started just corresponding on, on, on the nature of poetry, but it went from there into a sense of pastoral care, and C.S. Lewis would often write to encourage her. It's a good example of this team endurance. He writes, I must try, I mean, he's experiencing his own serious suffering, he writes, I must Try not to let my own present unhappiness harden my heart against the woes of others. You too are going through a dreadful time. Ah, well, it will not last forever, he writes. There will come a day for all of us when it is finished. God will help us all. And I love that. It's a part of the team sport of endurance. And brothers, God will help us all. I hope you believe that. 
you know, whether it's Owen or Virgil or Aristotle, they, they couldn't quite give us, or those we love, ultimately what we need here. Because the endurance required in our life, in our ministry, God has um, supplied in Christ Jesus predominantly, and it's an endurance that we can now apply together towards that end. You know, I didn't know Greg Pisi particularly well. Um, I, I actually never met him. I'd heard a whole lot about him and knew people who knew him a lot. Um, but I did see his wife made a public comment um, at, 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 at just before his passing, actually. And she wrote that God never promised life would be easy in this world. So glad he promises so much in the next and uh, your life, your ministry, your health, and especially in the context of uh, this passage, um, your, your gospel ministry that the Lord's got ahead of you that you're training for, it won't necessarily be a bed of roses. It won't be easy in this world. I don't know what your five-year ministry development plans are. You can ask these guys. They've probably got one up to date. But I do know this, that if we've died with Christ, we will live with Christ. And if we endure, then we will also reign with Christ. And that's the hope held out to us this morning, this passage. The old Puritan Richard Sibbs, the heavenly Dr. Sibbs, put it this way as I wrap it up. He says, if a man be going to a desired place, howsoever the way be troublesome, the sweetness of the end will make him forget the discouragements of his passage. Perhaps we must wade to heaven through a sea of blood. It matters not. The end will recompense all. Though we lose our limbs by the way, it's better to limp to heaven than to dance to hell. And so then, my brothers, I would just say this to you. Keep going. But more than I'd say, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.